Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Mr. Miller here and this is video for Thursday the 7th of May. Uh, so we are going to move on today. Uh, yesterday you were working on uh, the uh, Great Society worksheet. We're going to go ahead and move on today to uh, topic 16 through 18 notes and we're going to hopefully get through uh, number 12. So we're going to go 9 to 12 uh, today. So where we left off the other day was talking about the Great Society. So that was hopefully a good segue for people to get into uh, to get into this uh, next uh, section. I guess the what we were working on yesterday. So uh, starting off with number uh, with number nine here, uh, we have uh, Supreme Court cases that happen in uh, the 1960s, and many of these Supreme Court cases, while they might not be the most famous court cases, the most important ones to ever know, uh, there are a lot of court cases here that had very big impacts in American history. Uh, on American society. So these are all important court cases. None of these would be probably in my top four, uh, my top three or four, uh, but these would all be probably in the top 10, uh, at least in the top, uh, top 15 of Supreme Court cases that have happened in American history. So these ones are all important, so we've got to talk about them. And they all happened in the 1960s, so there you go. Uh, the first one that we got to talk about, uh, I'm just going to kind of go through these one by one, and you should just uh, probably just write down the brief gist of what uh, what these uh, court cases we're talking about. Uh, this first one is talking about Engel versus Vital, uh, Engel v. Vital. Uh, it is talking about school prayer. Uh, basically, in uh, a lot of places in America at this point in the 1960s, uh, early 1960s, there were places, schools, that required uh, kind of a mandatory prayer to start the day. Uh, this was viewed by some people to be, I don't necessarily know if offensive is the right word, but it was viewed to uh, kind of limit people's First Amendment rights. If you are forcing somebody to say a prayer uh, that they might not want to say, uh, then that is, that is uh, violating religious freedom. Uh, the separation of church and state as is uh, outlined in the First Amendment, uh, freedom of religion. So uh, the Supreme Court decides in 1961, in the case of Engel versus Vital, that school prayer is uh, violating, mandatory school prayer violates the First Amendment. So mandatory school prayer is not okay, uh, not okay to uh, mandate on kids. Uh, it is not saying that if you are sitting in class and you want to say a prayer, you can. That's I, you can't fight that. Okay, that is your right to do that. Uh, so long as it does not uh, damage the education environment for the rest of everybody else, uh, so you can do that. But the school cannot mandate, or the state of New York cannot mandate that you have to say a prayer every morning. Uh, so that is that is kind of what what is uh, refused there. Uh, second one, Gideon v. Wainwright. Gideon v. Wainwright. This was in 1963. Uh, and now we're going to get into uh, these next two have to deal with criminals, rights of criminals. Okay, deal with the uh, Fifth and Sixth Amendments. So Gideon v. Wainwright deals with... I'm sorry, that's yawn number one for the day. Uh, Gideon v. Wainwright deals with accused criminals, and it says that if you are a criminal, you must be offered a lawyer uh, before you're questioned, okay? Before the police can ask you any question, if you're accused of a crime, before the police can ask you any question, you must be offered a lawyer. If you can't provide one for yourself, one will be provided to you under the, uh, one of the amendments, I think the Sixth Amendment, maybe. Um, so you have to have you have the right to a lawyer and you have to have that provided to you or at least the option given to you if you choose to take it now you can say nope i don't want a lawyer and you can talk or try to defend yourself but if uh, they offer you one that is all they have to do they have to offer you one if you don't want it then you don't want it if you want it then great uh, but that's uh, accused criminals must be offered a lawyer before questioning uh, Miranda v. Arizona is a very famous one. This is probably 
uh, if you were to think, if I was to think, this is probably the one that I was like hesitating whether or not to put it on my Mount Rushmore of Supreme Court cases. This is probably number five of uh, Supreme Court cases, uh, Miranda v. Arizona. Uh, you have heard undoubtedly uh, in your lifetime of things called Miranda rights. Uh, you have heard the Miranda rights. Uh, I can guarantee you this. Every cop show ever uh, pretty much uh, uses the Miranda rights. Uh, when they catch the criminal like five minutes to the end of the show because that's like the climactic moment uh, they always start with the Miranda rights uh, and they start with you have the right to remain silent anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law you have the right to an attorney yada 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 and that's all that they ever really usually get to in these cop shows because all that they want is the dramatic moment you have the right to remain silent anything you can and, or anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law all that stuff, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of rights uh, that are in what's called the Miranda rights. Basically, uh, basically, this court case said that uh, these rights had to be read to you uh, while you are uh, being accused of a crime. So you are charged with a crime and these rights must be read to you. Uh, these rights outline, the Miranda rights outline your Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. So the story behind these Miranda rights Basically, there was a guy named Miranda. Uh, his last name was Miranda. Uh, and he was accused of, I believe it was uh, rape and murder of somebody. Uh, and so he was uh, a Hispanic guy and he was arrested. And they basically said that he kind of had some rights and they read, or they didn't read him any rights, but he didn't, he wasn't really uh, a native English speaker. Uh, so he thought that he had to confess to everything. So what he did was he confessed to everything. And then they said, okay, well, we'll find you guilty for that. Uh, but he ended up going to the Supreme Court and saying, I didn't have my Miranda rights. I didn't have my rights read to me, my Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. I didn't know that I could refuse to uh, incriminate myself. I didn't know that I could remain silent if I wanted to. Uh, so what they did was, interestingly enough, even though he did this, they threw out the conviction of rape and murder. Okay, threw it out, said, nope, you're no longer convicted. And then what they did was they retried him. Uh, they retried him on the charges and found him guilty again using legally obtained evidence. So he's not out walking on the streets. I believe he uh, he's really old or either he just died. I don't remember. Um, I think he actually might still be in prison. Let me look that up real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, so fun fact, I was completely wrong. He died in 1976. I was thinking of somebody else. I don't remember. Uh, but Miranda died. Uh, anyways, he gives his name now to the set of rights that must be read to you when you are uh, accused of a crime. Now, they must read these rights to you. They do not recite them from memory. Okay, most cop shows that you see, they like are handcuffing the person and then they're like, you have the right, right to remain silent and they're like pushing him against a cop car. That would not be really what would happen. They would arrest them and then when they got back to the station, uh, the police station or the jail, they would read them their rights off of this card. Okay, why would they read them their rights? Uh, well, they read them the rights to make sure that uh, they get them all correctly. Okay, if they miss any of the words or if any of the words are jumbled or confused or not clearly read, uh, then somebody could have a claim that they didn't have their rights read to them clearly and they did not know what their rights were. So they would have an opening for a lawsuit. So they read them off of a card. Every police officer has a card and they read them to you. Um, even if they have them memorized, which most of them probably do, uh, but they read them to you. So then that way you uh, you know them for sure. Uh, and they close, but they basically, um, they basically, they also make you sign the card after you read them. Uh, so you are affirming that you have heard your rights. Uh, so that way they don't have a lawsuit on their hands potentially. Now, hopefully nobody's in a situation in their lives in which they need to have their Miranda rights read to them. However, uh, odds are that probably somebody watching this video will get in trouble with the law at some point and will have their uh, Miranda rights read to them, which is sad. Hopefully it doesn't happen. I really hope so. Um, but those are the Miranda rights and Miranda v. Arizona. Now, last one here, Tinker v. Des Moines. Uh, Tinker, uh, there was a group of students, uh, one of them or a couple of them had the last name of Tinker. Uh, they were wearing black armbands uh, in school uh, to protest the Vietnam War. 
So they were wearing black armbands, and the school said, no, you cannot wear those. Uh, that is violating, I don't know, some school law that you can't wear, uh, can't wear armbands. So they were violating that code of conduct, and the school forced them to give up their armbands. Now, uh, they end up suing, and it goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, the statement was made that uh, wearing armbands in school is very, very minimal. It does not distract people's education, uh, so it is okay. You can do that, according to the Supreme Court. You can wear a black armband in school if you want to. Now, uh, this goes uh, to kind of say, uh, when you enter the school building, you do not shed your First Amendment rights at the door. You do not lose all of your rights at the door uh, when you enter the school building. You do have some of those rights limited. So like I would say, you can wear armbands, but you can't wear uh, offensive shirts or offensive, uh, I don't know, like a, a Nazi armband with a swastika on it. You can't do that because that would be hate speech and offensive. Uh, and that would potentially, uh, I don't know, it would potentially uh, damage the educational environment. And hate speech is not protected under the First Amendment, so you can't do everything. But, uh, like I said, there, there are some rights that you still have, and you, you preserve those rights. Uh, but whether or not they are limited in school is another question, because most of them are limited in some ways in school. So, uh, those are the main Supreme Court cases in uh, the 1960s here. Now, we are going to get into world affairs in the 1960s, okay? How is America inter er, intervening in other places in the world? Okay, so number 10 here to start with, the Cuban Missile Crisis, okay? I'm not going to go through this in super depth. Uh, if we were back in school, we would actually be doing a big, uh, a big activity on this, so I'm sad that we're not able to do this. Uh, last year we tried this out and it was a big uh, big morning long activity where we shot off rockets and uh, did some math problems and some chemistry things and looked at a bunch of history documents on the Cuban Missile Crisis, so I'm really sad that we're going to be missing this, but I'll give you the rundown basically. Uh, so the Cuban Missile Crisis deals with Cuba, obviously. Uh, Cuba has been uh, kind of taken over by a communist uh, communist regime, uh, and the guy leading the communist regime, marching in the middle of this, or I guess walking in the middle of this picture with the cigar hanging out of his mouth, is a famous guy named uh, Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro. So Fidel Castro is the leader of communist Cuba, uh, and he ends up uh, kind of forcing uh, forcing a lot of uh, Cubans to either adopt communism or uh, potentially be killed. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, anti-communists in Cuba who end up fleeing to America. Uh, Cuba is just located like 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Uh, so Florida is very close and Florida ends up getting a lot of Cubans as they come uh, away from America or away from Cuba. So they're basically uh, exiles, as they call them. Uh, but we end up getting uh, a, a many thousand, almost maybe a million uh, Cuban exiles over the time. Uh, and many of them end up settle, settling in uh, Miami. Uh, so Miami is a big Cuban, uh, Cuban population, Cuban influence. So uh, they live as exiles here in America, basically adopting America as their home. And we take them in because we don't want them to be communist. So we're happy that they're here. Uh, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, launches a uh, kind of a move to get Fidel Castro out of Cuba. Uh, it is called uh, the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, which is right here in black, the Bay of Pigs invasion. <coughs> So the Bay of Pigs invasion, basically they had trained a bunch of Cuban exiles uh, to try to storm uh, Cuba and train them up as an army and then go ahead and fight, uh, fight back against the Cuban uh, communists. So the Bay of Pigs is located here on this map. You can see it here on this arrow. Uh, so they stormed the Bay of Pigs. Turns out to be kind of a massive, massive failure. Uh, the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion was poorly planned by the CIA, poorly implemented, and uh, it kind of shows as a big failure for John F. Kennedy. Uh, this is kind of one of his major failures as president was this Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, so not really noteworthy, but uh, I don't know, it's a negative thing that happens here. 
That's yawn number two, I'm sorry. Now, the Cuban Missile Crisis as a whole uh, starts out in 1962. Basically, the Soviet Union had talked to uh, had talked to Cuba and had gotten Cuba's approval to start building military base, uh, a military base, but also uh, missile launch sites in Cuba. Now, obviously, America, when we catch wind of this, we do not like this fact because uh, missiles that are in Cuba uh, can easily hit anywhere in the United States that they want to hit. Uh, within reason, beyond probably the far stretches of the West Coast. Uh, but they could hit Washington, D.C., they could hit probably New York City, depending on what missiles they were. Uh, so so they could, you know, pretty dangerous if these Cuban missiles were um, launched, or the Soviet missiles in Cuba. So we basically blockade Cuba, and we force uh, the Soviet Union to make a choice. Either they are going to uh, break through our blockade and kind of start World War III, or they are going to back down. So this is a time period. It's a very tense moment here. This is probably the most, uh, the closest America ever got to going to uh, a war with uh, the Soviet Union in the Cold War. So the the closest the Cold War ever got to kind of sparking and starting a bigger war. So uh, we basically put our foot down and we say, you need to remove these missiles from Cuba. Um, eventually, we come to an agreement with the Soviet Union saying that we're going to remove some missiles from Turkey and uh, the Soviet Union is going to remove their missiles from Cuba and we kind of back down. Okay, so this Cuban Missile Crisis ultimately ends up uh, kind of simmering uh, and backing down. Uh, it doesn't ever boil over into a bigger, into a bigger uh, result here. So uh, that is the Cuban Missile Crisis as a whole in 1962, a very, very famous but very tense moment in this, uh, in this time period. Now let's move on to number 11, uh, tensions in Berlin and Vietnam. Okay, let's start with Berlin. Uh, the Soviets, uh, let's look at the map over here. I'm sorry, another yawn, that's number three. Uh, let's look at this map over here. So we've got this uh, this map of East and West Germany. Uh, in East Germany, which was Soviet-controlled Germany, uh, Berlin was there. As we know, we had the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift and all that uh, all that stuff that we've already talked about in last unit. The Soviets want Berlin at this point. They want West Berlin kicked out. Uh, they want to kind of take over West Berlin in order to uh, remove the uh, non-communist influences from in the middle of East Germany. Uh, so the Soviet uh, leader at this point, uh, his name is Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev is the Soviet premier. He takes over, um, I believe he takes over for Joseph Stalin. Uh, I might be missing a premiere in the middle there, but he's uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, yeah, so he's uh, in charge here. In the early 1950s, he tries to pressure America to give up West Berlin, which we refuse to do. Uh, so we end up uh, kind of falling victim to what the Soviets want to do. They surround West Berlin uh, with all of East Germany. So what do they do? They build a uh, wall around West Berlin, okay, called the Berlin Wall. So they build a wall around West Berlin uh, to keep uh, the West or keep the East Germany people and the East Berliners out of West Berlin. Uh, the problem was uh, capitalism in what was West Berlin was very, very attractive, and these East Germany people and these East Berliners were running into uh, running into West Berlin because they liked it better over there. Uh, so they build this big wall, a uh, big concrete wall, all around that section of the city. So uh, that is the um, Berlin Wall kind of put in place in 1961. Now let's move on to uh, Vietnam, okay? So Vietnam happens to be the next battleground in this Cold War, and that's going to be where we end up focusing for the next four or five or six slides. Uh, within reason, within, with a few exceptions. So uh, Vietnam is down in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so you can see here Vietnam's this uh, white uh, shaded country. Uh, China's just to the north, uh, northeast of that. Uh, Thailand, Cambodia, all that area. So 
Vietnam. Number three, uh, Vietnam here. Uh, Vietnam was controlled by the French, and the French are having a very hard time controlling Vietnam in the uh, 1960s because there is a large group of communists who are rising up in uh, rising up in Vietnam. So in Vietnam, there is, uh, like I said, a large group of communists that are trying to push the French out. America ends up getting involved. Uh, because we end up feeling that uh, Vietnam falling would be a very bad thing for us in uh, kind of our fight to prevent communism from spreading. Remember, we've got that idea of containment, and we don't want communism to take over another country. So we would end up with, uh, we end up with kind of this perspective uh, that's called the domino theory, the domino theory. This domino theory says, if we uh, let one country fall to communism, as is pictured over here, Vietnam, if we let one country fall to communism, it's going to push over all these other countries that are in Southeast Asia. Uh, and one by one, they are going to fall, and we need to prevent them from falling because they're going to fall to communist, and we need to stop that from happening. So we say, okay, we've got to get in early in Vietnam to stop it from falling to communism. So what ends up happening? We join in. Uh, to send uh, send troops uh, to help out these uh, non-communist soldiers. Uh, basically, how it had worked out was there was a large number of people down in South Vietnam who were capitalist and not communist. Uh, we would maybe call them nationalist. Uh, and so then in the top part of Vietnam, uh, you end up with communists. Uh, and so communists, uh, the main leader, Ho Chi Minh, uh, which we'll talk about uh, talk about later, I guess. You probably remember his name from last year uh, in global history. So um, we've got this kind of north versus south divide, just like we had in Korea. In, in the south, you've got the uh, non-communists. In the north, you've got the communists. So how does this all kind of shape out or shape up here? America ends up getting involved in this war uh, under a couple different, I guess, one thing happened. Uh, basically, America had put uh, a set of, uh, or I guess a ship, out here in this area called the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, you can't really see it that well. Let me expand this. So the Gulf of Tonkin over here in uh, just off the coast of northern Vietnam, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, we had uh, basically set up uh, a group, uh, or basically put a boat there, and the boat gets fired upon by North Vietnam, obviously, because that's what happens when you put a uh, when you put a ship in dangerous waters. So the boat gets fired upon and ends up uh, kind of allowing for uh, the president at the time, Lyndon B. Johnson, <coughs> to advocate for uh, military exercises in Vietnam or advocate for a military invasion. So this resolution that gets passed is called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. I'm trying to underline it with my finger. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. So the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution basically gives military powers to the president to fight back after we've been attacked. Okay, so we're fighting back here. Now we end up getting into uh, guerrilla warfare. Okay, guerrilla warfare. I guess I should go on to that slide. We're on to number 12, by the way. Um, as we get into, yeah, U.S. opens the Vietnam War. So, um, ends up getting into guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla, G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. I don't have it spelled out there, but uh, I just spelled it for you. Uh, guerrilla war ensues. Uh, you have a group of fighters uh, that are the communist fighters called the Viet Cong. Uh, the Viet Cong. Uh, and they are ambushing American troops. They know the territory way better than we do, and they're setting traps and all sorts of all sorts of horrible things that our soldiers are kind of walking into. Uh, so what do we do? We end up uh, trying to uh, trying to more or less kind of remove the advantage. And the advantage was the thick uh, tropical climate that the uh, Vietnamese were kind of fighting with. So we end up trying to burn down a lot of the area, uh, burn down a lot of the vegetation, the forest area, 
uh, the tropic area that we're dealing with. So we have two different uh, tactics for that. Uh, one of them would be napalm, uh, which is a burning material. You set it on fire and it burns as it goes. Uh, it's kind of like a jelly sort of thing. Uh, and the Agent Orange, Agent Orange is an herbicide, meaning it kills plants. So Agent Orange is very, very dangerous. And a lot of people come across this Agent Orange and then end up with uh, cancer later on in life. A lot of American soldiers were dealing with a lot of things based on this Agent Orange. Uh, so we end up with um, kind of efforts to uh, take back control or reduce the advantages that the uh, reduce the advantages that the Viet Cong have here. Now, uh, I would say at the beginning of the war, most Americans support the war. Okay, most Americans support the war. Thousands of soldiers are volunteering for this war. So there's a lot of Americans uh, who are kind of on the side of the war and, and actively, uh, actively thinking that, yes, this is a good thing that we should be doing. We should be fighting against these Viet Cong uh, and reducing the opportunity for them to spread their communism. So we'll get into kind of how that ends up changing tomorrow when we get into the anti-war movement. And then we should get actually all the way through the end of the Vietnam War tomorrow. Or no, no, Monday, because this is Thursday. So that means tomorrow's a catch-up day. Okay, tomorrow's a catch-up day. Wow, my week is flying by. Uh, so tomorrow's a catch-up day, and we'll get back into the Vietnam War on Monday. So from here, I've got, uh, I think I've got two questions for you uh, on a Google form. So go ahead and answer those questions, and uh, then you'll be done. So I will see you guys back here again tomorrow when I check in and let you know what's due for the week. So uh, take care until then. See you later.